Bless his name. This truly is the day the Lord has made. I woke up this morning, and when we stepped outside in the sunshine, I just felt God saying, it's a new day. It's a new day. We need to step into the new thing of God, what he's doing. He sits on the throne. He's in full control. He is orchestrating all of history to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So let's just prepare our hearts this morning and give him the worship and the honor and the glory to his name. Thank you, Lord. Father, we bless your name. We bless you. We worship you. God, we're here today to say Jesus is Lord, and he deserves all of our praise and all of our worship, all of our adoration. Let's worship him together. Come on.
Yeah, sing out your own song. Sing out your own song. This is a moment. just want you and nothing else and nothing else oh nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else Jesus nothing else will do I just want and nothing else, and nothing else, oh, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. Oh, and I never want to leave. Oh, and I'm not here for blessing. Because Jesus, you don't owe Just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. So take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Oh, I'm sorry when I've come. My agenda, I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough, so take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up, I'm caught up in your presence. I just want.
just sang another song Would you take me back to where we started? Guess I'm opening up my heart to you Right now, right now, right now Oh, and I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough So take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you. Caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up. Jesus, you don't owe me anything. It's more than anything that you can do. I just want you. And I'll stay. Simplest of all love songs I want to bring to you. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I.
turns to wrong you and nothing else oh and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else Jesus nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just Make this your prayer today. Close your eyes and sing this to him.
John the Baptist, pointing at Jesus, said, He must increase, and I must decrease. No, he was speaking of his own ministry at the time. He was also declaring a reality that it was the risen Christ in us that would increase in our lives and we would need to decrease, die to ourselves, pick up our cross, follow him. Even like the mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds. But when it comes to maturity, it becomes a great and mighty tree. And that's the Word of God in our hearts. Jesus inside of us, increasing. That we may bear fruit and point the whole world to Him. Oh God, that You would increase in our lives. That when people look at us, they just see more and more and more of Jesus. Mariah, let's sing that again. More of him, less of me. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. It's what I'm after. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. My desire, more of you and less of me, more of you and less of me, more of you and less of me. It's what I'm after, more of you and less of me, more of you and less of me, more of you and less of me. It's my desire. Father, our desire is for you. We give you all of our affection. All of us for all of you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you gave your all for us, God. We freely lay our lives down to follow you, to be called your sons and daughters. What an honor and a privilege. We bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Give the Lord a hand clap. Come on, wherever you are. So good. Bless God. Right now, out in Zoom, we're going to go into our breakout rooms, meet and greet some of the people that you're uh, in Zoom world with. And in the room here, we're going to maintain social distance, but turn around, introduce yourself, let people know who you are under that mask. And now it's time for the testimony of the week. Yo quiero contar mi testimonio. Yo tenía un año y medio que sufría de tinnitus. Eso es un sonido muy fuerte dentro de mis oídos que a veces no me dejaba dormir. Si estaba en un momento eh, trancada en una habitación, eh, no podía estar eh, cómoda porque sonaba mucho. Es algo muy desesperante. Yo tenía un año y medio tratando de, buscando formas médicas, medicina natural, fisioterapia, suplementos para que esto se fuera. Yo estuve orando al Señor todo el tiempo y un día trato de tomar un retiro durar una semana y pidiéndole al Señor que me guiara, que me dijera que yo estaba de acuerdo con lo que Él, él sobre la voluntad que Él quería en mi vida, ya sea sanarme naturalmente, ya sea sanarme espontáneamente, ya sea sanarme por medio de la ciencia. Estuve leyendo un libro muy bueno que se llama Medicamentos Bíblicos Naturales, donde explicaba que el Señor puede sanar de diferentes formas. Yo decía dentro de mí, óyeme, pero como que a mí nunca me pasa algo chulo, como que a mí nunca me... A mí me gustaría como que el Señor me sanara así, de un de repente. Y un domingo tranquila, viendo televisión con mi familia, justo en el momento donde yo estaba dándole pausa a la película para escuchar esa molestia que tenía en mis oídos, eh, me llama mi mejor amiga desde Estados Unidos. Me dice, Joana, recién están orando por personas con acófeno, con tinnitus. Y, y yo decidí acercarme al pastor para que orara por ti. Y por videoconferencia desde, a, desde Nueva York, él comenzó a orar por mí. Y me dice, ponme lo, las manos en los oídos, me pongo las manos en los oídos, y me dice, con autoridad, en el nombre de Jesús, que eso parta de tu oído, que ese sonido se vaya de tu oído. Yo comencé a orar. Y de repente comencé a sentir cómo el sonido bajaba. Hasta que terminamos de orar y yo me quedé totalmente agradecida del Señor. Llamé a mi mamá para contarle. Y todo perfecto. Luego de tres días me levanto y me suena el oído. Fuerte, 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 fuerte. Cuando el sonido me suena, yo digo, no puede ser. El Señor me ha sanado. Era un sonido tan fuerte que yo me acosté y lloraba. Yo lloraba. Y decía, Señor, ¿pero por qué? ¿Por qué? Lloraba, lloraba. Yo decía, no, 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 no voy a llorar. Yo voy a guerrear. Yo voy a orar. Porque ya mi sanación yo la tengo. Ahí me voy a orar. Y orando, comienzo a declarar todas las palabras de bendición que el Señor tiene para nosotros. Comienzo a declarar que por sus llagas fuimos sanos. Por sus llagas fuimos sanos. En el nombre de Jesús, yo te ordeno que te vayas en el nombre de Jesús. Oré, oré, oré. Me postro en el piso. Cuando me levanto, el sonido se me ha ido hasta el día de hoy. Hay que apoderarse de la promesa de que el Señor tiene para nosotros. Hay que apoderarse de su promesa. Si el, el Señor nos promete sanación, si el Señor nos promete que somos sanos por sus llagas, tenemos que apoderarnos de esa promesa y no permitir que la incredulidad y la duda nos venzan. Apodérate de tu promesa. Apodérate de la promesa que Dios te ha dado. Una promesa de vida. Una promesa eterna. Dios te bendiga. If you have a testimony, we'd love to hear it. Email us at info at lifecenternyc.com. Thank you for listening and have a wonderful Sunday. For those of you that were here in the room, you remembered Curtis had a word of knowledge for ringing ears. And then Rossi, actually, this is her friend. She lives in Switzerland, this woman. And so she had the faith to, to you know, call her up, connect with her. And then Curtis prayed for her from this room. 
and the rest, you know, you just saw on the screen. And so how amazing is that, too? It's like the Lord doing things in this city, taking it to the nations. And we've been praying about that as a leadership team here for quite some time. Like, what is our calling here in New York, but also how it reaches the nations? And so if there's anybody in the room, is anybody here have ringing in their ear right now? Yeah. Here, Kevin, can you, can you facilitate that a bit? But yeah, we've got a couple right up here. So Kevin, Kevin, and maybe if Kevin, you grab somebody else, they're going to pray for you right now. I'm going to keep talking. Maybe you guys can just go like to the, yeah, maybe over there. That's cool. Wherever you want to do it. Um, but, um, and let's just, let's just extend a hand to them right now. Let's just, we'll, we'll all be a part of this. Even on Zoom, you can put your hand on the screen, all right? So, so we just thank you, Father, right now for opening up opening up ears and, and for ringing to cease right now in Jesus' name. We just thank you, Lord. We command these ears to, we command silence of all ringing and open up their inner earlobes to hear clearly right now. Give them ears to hear. Give them ears to hear, ears to hear you in Jesus' name. So they're going to keep doing that, and that's good. Um, let's, let's let them keep doing that. Um, and hey, maybe next week or maybe, maybe today we'll bring them up here. Um, but I, I want to just give a, give a quick highlight to a few things that have been going on that we mentioned. First of all, please be sure that you register for church. So look at your neighbor and say, I need to register for church because all these seats are filled and I need to make sure I get here. Um, so you can register right now, actually. So if you go um, to, the, to our website or just the link you used last week, it's the same link. It's for 228. Register right now for next Sunday. All right. We will have a cutoff. And so, like you see today, we at our we're at our capacity. So when we cut off, if you go to that link, it'll say close for this week and it'll give you information to sign up for next week. All right. So please do that. Another thing I want to note, communion with God, that class is happening the 24th. I know many of you have signed up for it. We are, we have we, we now have a wait list. So if you still want to sign up for it, you still can, um, but you'll be put on a wait list because, you know, if people don't show, then you can get, you can get in the class. But just want to note, for those who signed up, you're going to get an email this week for the Zoom link to that. It's Wednesday nights. If you still want to sign up, you can either do it um, through our email or you can do it here when you go to leave in the welcome desk. Um, lastly, I want to note that we have some other classes that we're going to be um, sharing more about in the coming weeks. So more classes coming, going on in spring. We're also going to be doing a gathering for those of you that are new to the community and want to just understand who we are, understand the vision of this house, the prophetic history of this house. So that's going to be coming soon. We'll give you more information on that. Um, but yeah, we're, we're excited to have you. I'm going to bring up um, Corley, and Corley hadn't been here. She's been running around the world for, for a month or so. So let's give a big round of applause for Corley. She's doing the offer. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be back in church. <laughs> uh, I was following it online when I wasn't here, listening to it afterwards, and I really want to encourage you guys to, even when you're not here, it's such a blessing listening to the worship, listening to the message, and Thank you so much, worship team. You really pressed in today. Uh, there was a point with worship where it felt I was just standing in front of Jesus and just just saying to him the words that we were singing, and, and that's quite powerful. Uh, now, why am I here? Colt asked me to do the offering message prayer, and this is coming out of personal experience of the last month. We... Or, I do the things that the Bible say. I've, I tithe and offer. I read my Bible daily. Like there, there comes a point where it's like uh, you almost get into the runt. And you're doing it. And I love Jesus. And then I realize I miss hunger. And today I want to ask you guys as offering, not to just offer your money, your time, but just offer what you have. Take off that mask that we're wearing right now and say, like, God, I'm so hungry for you. Like, whatever you have, it, you need to be all consumed by God. There's an urgency in this time. We can see, like, we are at capacity. The COVID and the world has tried to shut us down, and they couldn't. Even, like, even if they try to suppress us, the voice that's going to come out of this city is going to blast through the world. Yeah. But it needs to come from hunger. It needs to come from that hunger pains. And, like, God, we need everything of you. 
And we're offering you everything we have. We're offering you, you our dignity. Huh? How many of us are struggling with that? Like, I'm not going to fall down here on the ground. Like, I have control. I have self-control. But this is not. And the message that I want to read to you guys, because we so quickly get complacent and not realizing where we are. So uh, this is in Luke 18. Um, two, went, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. I don't care who it was. It could have been a banker. It could have been a doctor. It could have been you. And what we're now saying is that um, he stood there and said, thank you, God. Like how many times we come and thank you, God, but meanwhile we're just complimenting ourselves. Um, <laughs> thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. Thank you, God, and I'm still at least coming to church. I didn't fall away in this time period. How many of us come like this? And now I say, say, thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. I do not cheat. Like, I, I, I don't do the vulgar things that some of the world do. I'm not a sinner like everyone else. I don't commit adultery. I don't sin. I'm, I'm, I don't cheat. I don't sin. I don't commit adultery. I'm reading some of this twice, so maybe it applies doubly to some of us. <laughs> um, like, I'm certainly not like the world with the loose morals and stuff. I'm saying, I'm just translating it to 2021. 20, um, I fast twice a week. Oh, we fast every three days of the beginning of the month. Some of us just like spontaneously fast in the week. Um, and I give my tenth of my income. Um, this is sometimes us. But then we see the other person. And we pray for the spirit of repentance to come over us. To just the other person come and say, I'm a sinner. And he starts saying all the things that he's doing wrong. So I want to ask you guys today to take off your mask. Offering whatever you've like, even in your self-righteousness. Because Jesus started with, this person was confident in their own righteousness. We cannot be confident in our own righteousness. We have to be confident in Jesus. Do you know who Jesus said, the sinner walk away right? He was humble. So I, I'm not going to pray quickly, but this is offering. If you want to offer financially and offer ex abundantly more than what you normally did, there's usually information there. There's envelopes in the back. Do it. If it's more than money and you're like, God, I need to offer you my, my um, work. I've been doing it out of my own strength and I need you. I desperately need you. I need you in my family situations. I need you for hunger in this season. And our hunger needs to be so heavy that it transforms the city that is Jesus written over New York City and not NYC. So um, I want to ask you if you, um, not just financial offering, but if you need to feel you have an offering to God right now, if you just stand in your place, and then I will um, just pray for us. So I'm at that place, and I'm already standing, so I'm going to kneel down. So if, you, if this is you, and you need to offer something to God, I want to ask you just stand up and ask for God for more hunger. So, God, we just come to you, and we just come humbly to you, God. We, are, we repent of all the things we think that we got it. We don't got it. We need you in this time and this day, God. We need more of you. We need you so desperately that even around us, it will radiate out, and desperation will come into this city. So, God, Jesus, we need you. We need you in this season. We give you our mask, our figurative mask of doing it in self-righteousness for already tithing, for already be, um, being in your word. And we thank you, God, that you still come and seize us. You still come and answer our prayer. But God, I pray for a blessing of hunger in this room. Thank you, God, for the repentance that we can have and the hunger that you're giving us. Amen. Okay. So th that came out of personal experience of a month long. Um, but this <laughs> uh, so I want to welcome Vanessa. There's not many people that I let speak into my life and follow them, um, but Vanessa is one of them. Um, and the gift that she is to this body, to this city, to just families ever, everywhere and motherhood is, is such a unique thing. So I just want you guys to reach out your hand and we should just, God, thank you for the talent you put on Vanessa. Thank you for the blessing she is to us to her family, 
to the city and just to families everywhere for what she's carrying. We thank you that your words will come out of her mouth. And thank you that you raised her up for the woman she is today. Amen. Well, I'm really excited to speak to you guys today. And um, yeah, I'm just going to start and um, we'll go from there. Okay, so I want to just kind of paint this scenario for you. Um, you know, the disciples, we've been talking about being a student of the kingdom. Bill's been talking about it. Colt's been talking about it. And um, so th I'm, I was thinking about this um, text and the disciples. And one day they're, the disciples are with Jesus, right? They've been students of the kingdom for a while. Um, at this point, they've heard um, the Sermon on the Mount. They've seen miracles. They've seen deliverance. They've gone out on their own. And they have... Um, seeing God use them in powerful ways. Peter has walked on the water. Um, they have seen and they have learned about the kingdom. And then they come one day and they are sitting with Jesus and they're like, hey, all right, we've done a lot. We've seen a lot. We want to know. We have this one question we want to ask you. Okay, so, so who is the greatest Who's, who's the best, Jesus? Like, who? We've seen so much. Who is the greatest? You know, they've seen the transfiguration. And so you have James and John and Peter. So they probably were thinking maybe one of them. And they're asking this, like, who's the one? Who's that one? And maybe they're thinking, like, okay, once he tells me, that, then, I'll, then I'm like, okay, I'm on that team, right? Okay, I'm kind of like Peter. I'm bold and, you know, aggressive and full of faith, and so, so I, you just wonder what their thought process was, and so, oh, thank you. So, I'm going to get emotional, because the worship was so good. So, Jesus, he's with all his disciples, right? They've done so much, so, so much, and he calls a little child to him and places this little child on his lap. And he says, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Whoever takes this lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. And we're in this journey right now where we want to see how Jesus sees things, right? And, and Jesus is saying the greatest in the kingdom is children. Have you guys ever thought about why he would say that or what that means? So some of you know, and all of you may not know, but I'm a mom, I have three children, so um, my oldest one is almost six, so I've kind of been studying children for about six years. I'm a professional mother, <laughs> and I know a lot about children. <laughs> I'm studying one of the greatest in the kingdom, right? So I wanted to share with you guys today the revelations and what I've seen, what I've observed about children, and maybe just bring in a little... Um, Revelation to you guys why maybe Jesus would have said that the greatest in the kingdom are the children. And I tell this to my girls sometimes, and Nicole, my husband and I were like, okay, who does Jesus love the best? Who's the best? I'm like, children! <laughs> um, so it's just kind of fun because I know that they're valued in the kingdom. So the first thing, I have a couple qualities I'm going to go through, and um, I hope to get through them all, but if Holy Spirit just camps somewhere, we'll see. We'll we maybe just camp there. Um, but um, if I go like this, is the camera still okay if I'm on this side? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Because <laughs> I don't want to just be here. Um, I'm going to go like this. Okay. So the first thing I see in children is their sense of joy. And maybe you guys, that might be the first thing that you think of when you think of a child. It's their joy. And maybe we think of like them dancing, right? And, and maybe sometimes when we think like have childlike faith, that's where we think and that's kind of where we stop. And that's a great place to start. Um, but the one thing I, so I'm going to talk a little bit about joy right now. The one thing I really notice is that children have this baseline in their life of joy. Like 
even if they get hurt, even if they get frustrated, once they process that with like their parents or someone safe and secure, they immediately go back to that place of joy. They wake up in the morning full of joy, bright-eyed and ready to go. Um, and I think that that is really interesting. And as I was thinking about that, I was like, well, why? Why, why do they always have this joy? They're very present, you know. Um, they are so present that they usually forget, right, those pains and those things once they've left. So they don't really hold on to offenses. Um, they they have really great, if you're in a safe and secure family, right, these children have parents who are taking care of their needs, so they don't have to worry about that. So as I was reflecting, I was like, oh, yeah, so they don't really have to worry about the past. You know, they don't have regrets yet. They don't have regrets from the past. They don't have broken relationships yet, so they don't have that bitterness yet. They don't have suspicion about the future, about people. And, and so as I was reflecting on this, I was like, hmm, wow. And... Like, we kind of see that with children. They're really joyful, but we kind of do think, like, oh, but they're going to grow up. They're going to face the real world. And maybe you guys grew up and faced the real world and, world, and you face that rejection, right? You face that, that brokenness. You face the loss of innocence. And that robbed you of your baseline joy. And while, you know, the world kind of gives us coping mechanisms to kind of live with that pain, the gospel, right, gives us a full solution. Because the reality is that Jesus died for our sins, right? And he, he was raised from the dead. And, and when he came back, we now have a new life. We have that new relationship with Jesus. We now, maybe we don't have good relationships with our parents or with our friends. And maybe we're still working that out in the earthly realm. But actually, if you have a relationship with Jesus, now you do have perfect relationship again, right? You have a perfect father. You have Holy Spirit in your life. You have Jesus. And so I feel like with the whole joy, I feel the invitation because of the scripture says, unless you change and become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. And I feel with this whole baseline of joy, the Holy Spirit's really wanting to say to us today that, yeah, you have that, that all, but Will you change and will you come back and let me restore your sense of joy, your baseline joy? Let me restore the innocence. Let me restore, let me take your bitterness. Let me take the brokenness that you have lived in. And for some of you, it may be a daily thing, but I feel the invitation is to change and become like a child into that innocent, hope-filled, joyful place. Uh, you know, and I was kind of, this is just so random, but um, not random, but I was thinking about this, you know, and how in the scripture it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Um, and it also, you know, it says um, that um, a happy heart is good medicine. And you know what I was thinking? I was like, oh my gosh, maybe that's why kids are so, have so much energy. I mean, if you think about it for a second, if they have this joy, could that be why they have so much energy? through just life, you know, and through the day. And, and I, I just, so I feel like just even looking at a child's capacity to just go hard all day, I feel it's connected to joy. But we can have that, right, in the Lord. We can change. Unless we become like a child, we can change. And I really feel like the invitation is like the constant giving of the burdens, constantly Throwing off what has held you back, right? The Hebrews 12, 1, like throw off, unless you throw everything off that hinders, you can't run the race. And I kind of see that those pains and those things are keeping us from our joy, the joy that Christ died on the cross for, right? So I really, um, yeah, so, so that's the first one. That children have a baseline of joy, and the invitation is that we can go back to that place because of Jesus. So the next one that I see that children, a quality that children have that I think is really important to the kingdom is children walk in continuous fellowship with their parents. So, I mean, if anyone's been a parent or has been with kids, babysat kids, they, little kids, love when you play with them, right? They always want to play with you. They always want to play with you. <laughs> And they always are asking, will you play with me, will you play with me, will you play with me? Um, and my little Lilo, she's uh, four, just turned four. She 
is a picture of this. So, so we, she's home right now. Her older sister's in school. We just had a baby. It's snowing. It's quarantine. We are living in our two-bedroom apartment. And Lila is an extrovert. She's full of life. And I'm the only one around. <laughs> so she does this little sweet thing um, where she will play. And she's like in the living room. And whenever I'm trying to work on stuff, because you know I'm always like trying to fit things in, she'll play. And then she'll come. And she'll run in. And she'll like, oh, mommy, mommy, mommy. The whatever. The, the doll is now going to the store. I'm like, oh, OK. And then she runs out. And she's in, a few minutes later, she comes back in. Oh, and now they have in, they're in the car. I'm like, oh, OK. And then she runs out. It's like, oh, and now da, 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 da. And she does this constant like little flow of play, run in, connect with me, go out, play, run in, do her work, run in, connect with me. I have a little clip. Do you have it, Bianca? I'm going to show you. Um, so the other day I was working on my sermon, and I tried to like sneak my phone right here. So this is all really authentic. It's not staged. Um, let's see if it comes up. So I'll give you kind of a visual of what I'm talking about. There's no spiders or dirty belly bugs. The one that the one that can the kids get the help to them. She's playing the tennis at the top. Cause it's the only one that goes for the bedrooms. Because the mom is by herself, so the mom and dad will wake them up. Just wait and wait till she got to five. Around the clock, clock, day the wheel. This is a bigger one. She got bigger and bigger. This is ham, okay? I'm telling this is ham. So he's steady at hand. I should have brought, brought at the barbie so they get a new mom. Mm. No. You can see it. You see it? it? Okay. Okay. Oh, baby, we got to five. This is the other baby horse. And she waited and waited till she got. So it's really beautiful, and I'm so grateful Lilo's back there. So thank you, Lilo, for showing us. So that, I think, is it's hilarious, but... But think about your walk with the Lord if it looked like that, right? Like, she. What's so interesting is in her play, in her work, she. Um, if her connection with me is, it doesn't interrupt. It's just continuous. It goes in and out. It feeds her actually, right, in a sense. And so it's not even the stopping thing. It's so fluid, and the movement of her connecting and fellowshipping with her parents is just second nature. And I, I just. As, as maddening as that can be sometimes for me <laughs> when I'm trying to get something done, the beauty of that. And, and there was this time when I was, I was like, ah! And the Holy Spirit just began to speak to me about this is what it looks like to be a child of the kingdom. This is what it really looks like to be in fellowship with me. You know, you invite me in and, and you respond and there's this flow um, that we have just kind of, like when I think of the verse, John 15, 4, right? If you remain in me and I remain in you, right? Then you can produce much fruit is really what the verse says. And, and that, you know, remain in me, abide in me, dwell in me, stay attached to me. And children have that really beautiful thing. Um, and I think that's also a connection to the baseline of joy is that because of that fluid connection and fellowship with their parents, with the father, with the mother, they feel that security constantly. And I wonder sometimes, too, if we don't have that joy because we're not secure enough in our connection with God. And so that continuous fellowship is an invitation, once again, to say, get, get more attached to me right? Attach to me a little bit more. Make it more continuous. And that will also feed your joy, your security in life. So my number one was the joy. The children are joyful. They live in this baseline of joy. The second one, that children are in constant fellowship with their parents. The third one, the next one I want to talk about are children are open to the impossible. 
I really like this about kids. I'm very creative, and so I love their openness, and I can watch it in their play. Um, just the other day, Lilo, like, I was, <laughs> once again, we live in a two-bedroom apartment. We have three children, so our home is kind of almost just an entire playpen. Unfortunately, Sarah came over the other day, and I was like, oh, this is, isn't how it always is, but so, <laughs> like, the other day, Lilo, I was like, they had gone out, and I was just like, gonna tidy up a bit, and I go over to the, the couch, and I look at my like velvet pillows, they're like the one nice thing, right? And I look, and I'm like, what is in this? Like, what is this? And I open it up, it's like the My Little Ponies, all stuffed in there. And I was like, Lilo, what did you do? What is this? And she's like, oh no, it's, it's just, they're in a spaceship. <laughs> And I feel like that happens a lot where I'm like, oh, what are you doing? They just dump out all those toys. They're like, oh, well, Sally had to, had to get these all out because it rained. I'm like, no, 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 what are you actually doing? Like, their openness and creativity, right, is so, so cool and beautiful. Um, and I love to, like, the other day, too, once again, Lilu, we're, like, hanging out. So she's on my stories right now. Um, she had a stethoscope, and she was taking, like, her her dolls and taking them over and they were like flying and landing somewhere and she wasn't using it as a stethoscope and I find you know a lot of times like with humans and actually there's a study I remember watching this documentary a long time ago about brains and creativity and they would show kids like this blob this picture of a blob and they're like oh it's a star with like a, a you know a I don't know a dinosaur driving over it and then the adults like it's a blob it's black on a piece of paper and that rigidity that we kind of get as adults, right, is it kind of can limit us from thinking of impossible situations, thinking beyond possibility, reality sometimes, right? And I love that about kids, like they don't have that preconceived rigidity. And so, yeah, the stethoscope doesn't have to be that. It can be, you know, this doesn't have to be a nice pillow. Some things there are boundaries on, right? There is true. <laughs> there is black and white. So we're, we're teaching her that. I'm teaching her that one. But um, I love that they are so open to all these different scenarios and possibilities. And, and if you think about in the Bible, the Bible really highlights the success stories are the ones who were open to the impossible, right? Like, I mean, no one has a baby at 90 years old right? Like, no one just sings around a building and makes it crumble, right? Nobody, no teenager takes five little stones and exactly mathematically hits it right in the dead center of this giant, giant, and makes him die, and then totally shifts the kingdom. Nobody does that. And so you see, I feel like in adult life, we can kind of get that, you know, that that's not possible, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? And that can limit us. But children, I love that they are still open to the impossible. And I love that I actually want to just turn and read David. There is this, um, so I'm going to turn really quickly to 1 Samuel 17, 39, verse 39. Um, when I was a child, there was a song that I would sing at my church, like, famous kids of the Bible. I was, I don't know if anyone else knows that song. <laughs> But I was like thinking about, I'm like, okay, who are the famous kids? And they like say, David and Rhoda and the, the servant girl for Nahum and, um, and like the boy with the fish and the loaves, right? So I was like, oh, let me go back to David because he's a famous kid of the Bible. Um, I think he was like a teenager. But I just want to read, starting um, chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you want to open with me, uh, verse 39. We'll just start there. So this is the time he's already said, like, hey, Saul, I'm going to go. I'll, I'll fight him. Um, and then Saul tries to give him his armor. And he says, I cannot go in these, he says to Saul, because I'm not used to them. He, so he takes them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistines. Um, and then skipping down... Well, first of all, actually in verse 43, it's kind of fun, Goliath sees him, and he says, he said to David, am I a dog that you can come at me with sticks? I feel like that really shows, like, dude, you're a kid, you know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? This is adult's play. This is adult situation, you know what I mean? Um, and so right there, I, I get the sense that he's a, a kid. And this, I've never seen this before, but I'm going to read this kind of 
if I can, like a kid, because this is David's response. And to me, this is a kid's, like when they're in that anything's possible position, right? So David says to the Philistines, will you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin? But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down, and I'll cut off your head. This very day, I'll give you the carcasses of the Philistines' armies to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by a sword or a spear, and that the Lord saves, for so the battle is the Lord, and he will give all of you into my hands. Like, if you read that, it's kind of really exciting, because that is, I could just imagine him in his like, yeah, and God's going to do this, and God is going to do this. And I just invite you, like, if we entered the Bible in our relationship with God with that, like, and then God's going to do this, and then God's going to do this. Not like, okay, this is against me, this is against me, this is against me. It's not going to happen. But instead being like, this is against me, this is against me, this is against me, and I'm going to bring my sticks, and I'm going to bring my stones, and I'm going to throw them at you, and then everyone in the whole world is going to know that God saved today. You know, like we entered with that openness. Wow. Wow. And just even encountered the word thinking like that. I mean, I think about when it says, you know, that um, all the, um, the, the, the saints, you know, are praying for us, right? And, and, I, and I was thinking about that. I was trying to engage the Bible with, with that excitement. It's like, oh, normally I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. I, 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 whatever. I don't really know what that means, right? But to be like, whoa, I have this old cloud of witnesses praying for me and, like, cheering me on. Like, if I really read that with that openness and that childlike, what would that do to my spirit? And so I invite you, the invitation is, like, enter into the word with the openness of a child to say, like, what would that look like, you know? Like, and, and I just, yeah, I, I really believe that there is this, yeah, if you just look through the word and even the loaves and the fishes, right, with the little boy, uh, you know, it's like I feel like Jesus was constantly kind of so generous as he offered hints to the disciples, you know. We don't want to put the disciples under the bus because we probably would all be in that position. So as much as you want to be like, oh, the disciples didn't do that, uh, you know, we need to honor them. <laughs> but, like, it was really sweet. He was like, well, oh, you know, when he's like, okay, everyone's hungry. We should send them back. He's like, well, what, why don't we feed them? And they're like, oh, there's nothing here. We should go back. He's like, well, what do we have? Um, and I love that he was kind of opening, helping to unlock that idea of impossibility. But I love that it was a child. And I could just imagine him being like, I don't know. I have two fish and five loaves. I, I don't know. What could God do with this? Maybe he could do something, you know? And I, I, so I just invite you. That, that next invitation is enter the word. Enter your relationship with God with an openness for what he can do. Look at all the facts. And then say, Okay, now what can God do? So the first one that we can learn from children, right, is there is a baseline. They live in that baseline of joy, right? The invitation is to stay in that baseline, to get back to that baseline of joy, to let go of the things that have weighed you down and come back into that baseline of joy. And the second invitation, right, for that we can learn from children is the constant fellowship with Father God. That if you're anxious and afraid, perhaps it's because you're a little detached in your relationship with God. And that constant can be every, I'm telling you, Lily, that's just like every 30 seconds. I kid you not. <laughs> so if you need it every 30 seconds, go there. <laughs> and that third that children can teach us, the invitation is to this, to look to the word and, and engage with God with an openness that you're open to the impossible happening. So my next thing that we can learn from children is that children are constantly curious and very sensitive. And this curiosity and sensitivity makes them very interruptible. And sometimes we could say distracted, but I'm going to say interruptible and why that's good. So I, children are very curious, right? Like many of you probably can attest to the times when, I mean, in that Home Alone, I'm sure you all remember in Home Alone when that kid's in the car, if you've seen Home Alone, he's like, does this have a da-da-da-da? Does this have, I don't know, he's asking all the questions about the car, and the guy's like, I don't know, okay, get lost. Do you guys remember that in Home Alone? Maybe you do or don't. But kids ask so many questions. Why this? Why that? Why, th like, Oh, my goodness, it's crazy. Um, 
And I find that as a mom, they ask these questions that sometimes can just, it's just Holy Spirit, and it just goes bing right to me. And I get a little offended, honestly. And that's interesting, because I think Holy Spirit really does use them when you get offended, right? Like, so Fern, because I'm being really honest with you guys right now. So Fern asked me one day, okay, so I have three. Uh, Florence was just born. We're <laughs> just doing it. And raise your hand if you're a mom. You're like, it gets overwhelming. And you say, I can't handle this, right? Like, you just say that. And I'm saying that probably to cold. I probably said that. So I'm probably like, oh, my gosh, this is too much. I can't handle this. I'm so stressed out. Like, this is too much. And Fern looks at me. She's like, well, why did you have so many children if it was too much? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my gosh. And in the moment, I was so offended. I'm like, I felt like I was like a, this 13-year-old, you know, who was like really irresponsible. I'm like, no, this is like fine. And people do this. And like three is not too much. You know, I just like got so offended. And she'll say things like this, right? And I think, uh, yeah, and so I was like, but it actually was interesting. It brought me to a place of the Holy Spirit where we kind of had two conversations. One was, why is too much or hard? Why, first of all, why is that a bad thing? And two, why am I trying to, like, like really, like, why, like, yielding more to, more to the Lord, right? Like, why, one, sometimes we do think hard is bad. And I feel like that, like, I just want to be out of the season because it's hard. And that there's an invitation, right, to lean more into the Father. There's an invitation to allow Holy Spirit to work out fruits of the Spirit in me, right? Um, and so I think that that, I actually would never come to that place probably if my daughter hadn't asked me straight up, well, if it's hard, why do you have so many children? <laughs> but there is that invitation. I love, their curiosity is really wonderful. Um, and those questions, that curiosity is, um, it really, it's something that I, I, I feel like a lot of times as parents, um, we kind of just want to answer and move on. But I feel like there is a, an opportunity that Holy Spirit really does speak through that. And the other thing is, too, their sensitivity, right? The curiosity and their sensitivity, um, they're very curious and very sensitive. And that curiosity and sensitivity leads to interruption. So I notice that kids are very sensitive. Babies, really sensitive, right? Like they're playing with something. Someone walks in. They're like, who's that? You know, they're like, they're just so, you, they're constantly distracted but they're sensitive. And you think about the situation, I'm sure many of you have seen this, where you try to walk to, you watch someone walking to like the store with their kid or walking to the subway. And it's a classic situation. I'm sure all of you can see. It's like, okay, I got to get to the grocery store. And unfortunately, I have to bring my child with me. And I know it's now it's going to take an hour instead of 20 minutes. And you're like walking. They're like, what's that? And you're like, uh, it's a dog. It's like, well, why is it not going back to the bathroom outside? Because I do. Well, why don't humans? Like, this literally has been a question. I'm like, I don't know. And then they're like, there's something in my shoe. I'm like, it's okay. Let's keep going. No, but it's really bothering me. I'm like, I know, but let's just keep going. And they're like, but I can't go because it's in my shoe. And, I, you know, and it's like that sensitivity, the questioning, the openness is like the perfect storm to not getting to your destination, right? <laughs> so as I was thinking about this, though, I was like, ah, oh, this kind of reminds me of a story in the Bible with Jesus. So I want you to turn to Luke 8 with me. And this is just like, I'm like, this is the store. This is like the disciples are just trying to get to the store. And Jesus is just sensitive. Jesus is sensitive, sensing what the Spirit wants to do. So, okay, so this is um, starting verse 40. All right. So now Jesus returned. A crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jarius, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was, about, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Jesus said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. I'll add this. He doesn't say anything. He's just like, let's just keep going, right? But Jesus said, someone touched me. I'm adding this. It's like, it's not a big deal. Let's just keep going. Come on, synagogue leader. This is our opportunity to totally, like, market the gospel and change the, the Jewish culture, right? Like, synagogue leader, if you heal this child, this, this girl, it's going to blow everything up, right? Someone touched me. 
I know that power has gone out from me. To me, that's like that sensitivity. You know, like that, there's something in my shoe. Like there's the sensitivity. And, and that's the sensitivity to the spirit and what the spirit wants to do. Like not trying to put the, dis- if I was a disciple, I'll say this. If I was a disciple, I would relate to Peter and I'd be like, let's just keep going. You know, and I would have missed this moment. I would have missed this, this healing if I w- if the disciples, if I was a disciple and I was in charge of that day's agenda. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. Like, just pause for a second. She was probably so used to being unnoticed. And Jesus' sensitivity said, no, I notice you. And I know I have to get somewhere, but I'm, it's not going to rob me of the journey and what you have for me in the journey. I'm going to be sensitive. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And while Jesus was speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And there was no openness, right? There was no, like, the do- your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said, don't be afraid. Just believe. Just believe. Well, that seems a little elementary, don't you think? Just believe. No, that he's dead. So don't be afraid. Just believe. And she will be healed. And unfortunately, if I was a disciple in this moment, not putting the disciples on the bus, but just where I think I would be, I'd be like, I think she's dead. You know, like, I don't think it's worth it. This was our moment to kind of blow up the gospel, to, like, heal a synagogue leader's daughter. This was a really big moment. And, like, who is this woman, you know? Like, maybe that was the thought. Maybe that would have been my thought. When they arrived, so Jesus keeps going. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. And he's just kind of like, you know, I don't know what he's saying there, but anyway. They laughed at him, knowing she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. And her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. And then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. That openness, guys, to miracles, the sensitivity, the curiosity. To not just be like, I got to get to the store, you know, but like, oh, something does bother me. Well, well, maybe Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, are you doing something right here? Like, what are you doing? You know, and this is what I really love about this story is Jesus took time for the process. He took time to stop, and he was able to complete and accomplish what he needed to accomplish at the destination. And I think a lot of times as adults, we're really focused on the destination and so afraid that we want to accomplish and get and do what we need to do in the destination that we miss this whole hour of time, this whole 30 minutes of time. But a child, they're so present. They're just like, that curiosity, that sensitivity allows them to see every moment is a moment that they, that could be something that God wants to do. So that leads me to my last point about journey, speaking of the journey and children, you know, um, not so destination focus. The last thing I see, I'll just repeat them again. Um, first, the invitation, right, is children are joyful. Their baseline in life is joy. And the invitation is let go and come back to that baseline of joy. The second one is children in constant fellowship with their parents. And that constant fellowship feeds them. It sustains them. It, it, it creates the enjoyment for them. And the third one, children are open to the impossible and encountering the word of God with that openness for the impossible, encountering, bringing God into our situations with that impossible thinking. 
The next one, children are constantly curious and very sensitive, and this curiosity and sensitivity makes them very interruptible. And staying like a child is being interruptible, letting the Holy Spirit interrupt you. And the last one, at Florence, my four-month-year-old four is teaching me is children are very surrendered to the process of development. So Florence... You know, a baby is really fun to watch because, well, one, they don't talk, and that's really enjoyable right now. <laughs> I'm joking, joking. <laughs> and they do whatever you want. You just take them wherever you want to take them. No, I'm joking. Um, growth with them is really slow. And there is this, I was watching, you know, Florence the other day and just watching how she's like, learning how to roll over, right? And which she'll, she's learning how to roll over, which eventually she'll sit up. But the amount of time it takes to practice rolling over, just rolling over is like five, six months. She's almost five months. She's still doing it, right? And I see this humbleness where she's willing, like she'll roll over, she's doing her little tummy time, and there's a point when babies are kind of like, ah, this hurts, and so you roll them back over. But right when you roll them back over, they immediately kind of forget, and they're like, ah, full of joy, full of love, and then they roll back over, you know, and they, and then they do it for a little bit, and then they kind of get bored, or they hurt, their arms hurt, and they scream, ah, and you were like, help roll them back over, but they're like doing this, and there's this interesting, like, surrender to the process, and I see that growth is really, really slow, and like these, if you look really closely, all these little steps, like a lot of times we want them to sit up, you know, and we want the exciting moments of development. And the rolling over is fun, but then after they first do it, you're like, okay, come on, let's get over this and let's move on to the next thing. But children, it takes a long time for them to grow those muscles. And I will say, you should check out Lilu's, our Florence's abs. Man, they are hard as a rock. I kid you not. You put her down. You can all look, and you can just see, like, she does this amazing, she's like Pilates every day. She has the strongest core in the world right now. Um, but you see her just working and working and working. And I, and I love that there is this, this humility to say, like, Mom, Dad, I don't have this. I mean, I got it. Let's move on. I know what I'm doing. You know, like there isn't that that I'm going to tell you or like, let's move on. You know, like and there's a surrender to it, too, because she doesn't know why she needs to do this. You know, like it's just got built in our bodies to just practice and practice and practice these little steps that will eventually give us the strength to move on to the next step, to move on to the next phase of life. Right. To move on to the next place of development. But there's a long time that it takes in that process and I feel that that's really important, you know, for us to understand and to yield more into that process that God has us each on. And I think as a mom, um, for me, this has been a, a, the process is kind of like my, if you know me or have any relationship with me, you know, like, I'm really been in a season where I've surrendered more to the process that God has me on. Hold on. Um, and... And there is, and it's interesting just as a mom, so kind of what this has taught me, like Lilu, watching Lilu, watching Florence, um, is sometimes a process it feels like, you know, we have these little things that get in our way, right? Like, like with Florence, it's like if she could just like, I don't know, if she just had more strength, she could move on and she could sit up. And so this was something that kind of, I had this conversation with Holy Spirit totally being honest again, that I have my list of things I want to accomplish and do. And like, think about COVID, right? Like, you kind of saw those advertisements, like, if you don't have a degree by the end of COVID, if you don't build your business by the end of COVID, then what have you been doing, you know? And that pressure to have to produce and to, like, get, like, oh, yeah, I, you know, started this whole company and I studied at Harvard online because you can do everything online, you know? Like, that list of what you can accomplish, there's so much pressure, and the Lord's really been speaking to me about the slowness of growth and, and, and his syllabus in my life. And so there was this one day when I was frustrated because I've been, you know, trying to work on these writing things. And I was like, God, I'm thinking this. I didn't say it out loud. But I definitely thought it. Kind of like, these kids are getting in the way of what I want to do. 
And the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, you know, Vanessa, you think these kids are getting the way of what you want to do, but actually they are the way of what I want to do in you. And these obstacles that sometimes we want to just get out of the way, and if they just get out of the way, then I can do what I want to do. They're actually the way to what God wants to do in us. And, and I realized, like, being surrendered to the process means saying, okay, God, what's your, what's your syllabus? Um, actually, in the worship team, if you want to come up, you can kind of start coming up. Um, what's your syllabus, you know? And <laughs> I kind of got this picture. Like, we're, you know, before maybe COVID or the fall hit, Holy Spirit, Father God, Jesus were out there. And you're like, you know, what do we want to work on with Vanessa? And they're like, oh, okay. Well, all right, we have it. Okay, so let's first set up the scenario. Okay, so let's give her her second child who has to be a girl so she can externally process and, and really relational. So she needs a lot of relationships. Let's give her to her about 2017. And, and then the pandemic will hit. She won't be in school yet. So she'll just, and she'll only have her mom around, right? So she'll really just need a lot of relationship. And, and she'll just be so creative that she'll just, she just want to just, like, keep asking mom to play with her, interrupt her, and just doing all this stuff. And, oh, and let's also give her baby in the fall because she thinks that she kind of has it together with these two kids. But we want her to know that she doesn't have it together <laughs> and that she needs to rely on us more. So we need to give her a third child because <laughs> she can't because she can manage, too. But, I mean, it was getting a little too sweet. You know, they're growing up, and it's like, so, okay, let's give her that. And then, okay, and then what's going to happen is she still has this desire to work on these things. But you know what? Let's have her second child come in like every five minutes and interrupt her. No, let's, let's do like two minutes, right? Okay, every two minutes. Actually, I think we should do about every 30 seconds. This will really grow what we want to grow with her. And they're like, oh, yeah. And the Holy Spirit, I just hear the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like this loving mother, but like so direct. Like, mm. And now we're going to produce in her self-control. And it's like, oh, that sounded so sweet, but actually self-control? No! Like, I do not, like, you know, you're like, oh, that sounds really nice. But you know what it takes to get self-control? If you ask Holy Spirit to give you self-control, let me tell you, it is painful. It is so maddening because he's going to, like, throw all this stuff at you. And in that moment, when you want to be like, shut up, you have to surrender and say, <laughs> like shake and be like, okay, I won't say it. Muzzle my mouth, like I yield to your self-control, Holy Spirit. You know, and I feel like I have those times where I'm just like, I got it, okay. All right, wow, I've grown, I've gotten self-control. And the other times I'm just like, oh my gosh, get me out of this, get me out of this, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go. You know, and the other day I felt like I had that. Like it was Wednesday and I was just like, I can't even do this sermon. I don't even know what I'm doing and there's no time. And I'm like, God, I'm done, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I feel like in that moment, you know, like, Holy Spirit, Father God, Jesus, are just, like, they're looking at each other, like, let's just roll her right back over again. <laughs> Touche, God. <laughs> and there I have to be, like, just, like, on my back, you know, smiling. <laughs> I'm going to roll back over and then be in that position, you know, and freak out. But the syllabus of the Holy Spirit, right, the syllabus of the Lord you know, and the other thing, too, it's like, in that moment, I feel like what I'm praying for, too, is like, breakthrough, breakthrough. And we pray that in the prophetic culture. If you've been part of, like, more of a prophetic church, like, you pray, breakthrough, breakthrough, breakthrough. And there was this one time where the Lord was, I was, like, like in this situation, in mothering, which is so wonderful. But sometimes, man, it refines you so much. I'm like, I don't want to be refined anymore. I just want to do my thing. Um, and I was like, where is the breakthrough? Oh, you know, woe is me. I'm having my own pity party. I'm like, God, you pray. The prophet said, breakthrough, breakthrough. And the Lord's like, you're in your breakthrough. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, you're in the breakthrough of patience. I'm like, what? What do you mean? Like, oh, yeah. The breakthrough of the gifts of the Spirit. That's what I love to do. Like, those are my breakthroughs. And it's like, oh. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't pray for breakthrough anymore. No, I'm joking. We want breakthrough. We want breakthrough, but we want the Lord's breakthrough. And, you know, and that's one of the things I've really learned is I had a lot of, I had a lot of human night goals for myself, yeah? And with children, sometimes the reality is you're like, here's my list. Nothing got done today. <laughs> and I've learned to surrender. But I know, you know, I know in the kingdom this season... We can start 
start to check off self-control. But that's beautiful, right? And so I just want to encourage you guys in your season, surrender to the process. And the breakthrough is here. If you're like stretched, that is your breakthrough because you're learning patience, you know? The breakthrough's here. If you're like, I want to slap this person, you're learning love, you know? <laughs> you're in a place of breakthrough, <laughs> you know? Self-control, gentleness, kindness. Children are surrendered to the process of development. So yeah, we're just going to close it here. I'm just going to pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are with us. I thank you, God, that you are our Father. Unless we change and become like a child, God, and humble ourselves like a child, we take the lowly position of a child, God, we want to enter the kingdom. We want to enter the kingdom. So Jesus, if you said that we must change and become like a child, we want to do that. So I just pray right now, God, for those who need to get back to that baseline of joy. I pray, God, for the healing, the restoration, that they will be able to give up their disappointment, that they'll be able to surrender their past, let go of their suspicion of the future and of people. I pray, God, that they can enter into that continuous fellowship with you that is their attachment, that is their security. God, I pray, God, that we will just stay open to the impossible of what it says in your word, what you want to do in our lives, that we will stay open to to the fact that you do impossible things. And God, make us curious and sensitive to your spirit that we will be interruptible with what you want to do in our lives, what you want to do on the journey before we get to the destination. And God, I pray that we will totally yield and surrender to the process that you have us on of maturing, that you are working the fruits of the spirit in our lives. You are making us like you, and that is the ultimate goal. That is a life well lived when we we yield to your process and allow you to to form us into who you want us to be, into the likeness of Jesus. So yes, Father, we thank you that you are a good Father and help us to become those children so we can truly enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. On Zoom, if you guys want to go into your breakout groups, you're free to go into those. And the rest of us, we can just enter into worship. Nothing else could take your place to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, bring me back to you. Let's all stand.
Thank you, Lord. And I think if you open your heart and your ears to understand it applies to every one of us because we're all on this journey and even as I was just standing here and listening to Vanessa and just knowing her for years and hearing her story and her desires and the times of delay and I felt like a proud father sitting there today and just seeing maturity and growth come forward and come out of her and then we could eat of the fruit of that that's what you're actually eating of you're eating of the fruit of a life surrendered but each of us I know even myself I've been even just processing my own journey at times and there's certain frustrations that I, even this past several weeks that I've just haven't even shared with anybody, but just the Lord, like how come X didn't happen and Y didn't happen. And I think you can all probably look at your own lives and we've had those journeys that's common to the human experience. But will we allow God Will we allow him to speak into that moment? Will we surrender those places? I think it's so important. Because each of your journeys, You know, we think we know where we're going, but he's actually, he's the one who wrote our book. And I know my journey's taken many detours, what I thought were detours, but actually they, were not, they weren't detours at all. They were right where he had me. I want to pray for those who have felt heightened frustration. Could be in your personal life, could be in your business relationships, it could, could be wherever, but you just, there's a high sense of frustration. And if, if that's you, we want to pray for you because there's, I really believe there's an anointing here present right now to give you grace for the season. So, if you could just lift your, lift your hand up, if that's you, if you're just in a time of heightened frustration. I want you to lift your hand. I want you to close your eyes. Those without their hands up, look around. We're going to stay socially distant, I meaning we're going to keep six feet, but just gather around. Start releasing grace over your brothers and sisters who have their hands up right now. Start releasing grace. Some it may be relations, relationships have not matured or gone to the place you want. Some it could be career, businesses, but whatever it is, whatever that area of heightened frustration, just keep your hand up because we're going to release grace because God has a process, and he's got a timing. Everything happens in season. In due season, the Bible says, you'll reap if you faint not or if you don't grow weary and give up. If you stay the course, the Bible says, don't grow weary in your well-doing. Don't grow weary in your seeking after the Lord going after him, choosing right over wrong, choosing to do the right thing. Don't grow weary in this journey because in due season, you'll reap if you don't give up, if you faint not. The Bible says that the vision that's in your heart awaits an appointed time. Though it tarries, 
wait for it with an earnest expectation. Wait for it because it won't tarry past the appointed hour. You're tarrying, waiting for the revelation of the appointed hour. And if you don't grow weary in your well-doing, staying the course, God is going to fulfill everything he's spoken over your lives. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom. God uses it all. He's really into the journey. He's really into the moment. Totally interruptible. Totally willing to stop for the woman with the issue of blood. Nothing else takes precedence over the moment of what he's doing. So, Father, we just release your grace right now. We release grace, grace, grace. Who are you, O mountain, before Zerubbabel? But you'll come down with shouts of grace, grace to it. Grace, grace, in Jesus' name.